Lukewarm. No, I'm just kidding. Just right. Luke just right. Luke. Lukewarm. Lukewarm. Luke was here, he'd be warm. That's what you're saying. Anyway, good to have you in the house of the Lord tonight. Welcome to our Wednesday night prayer service, Bible study. I got Brother Arthur going to uh, speak to us, share his testimony tonight, tell us about one that got gloriously saved, maybe more. I'm not sure, but anyway, looking forward to that. Let's uh, sing in a great old hymn of the past, page number 343. It's called Revive Us Again. And let's stand to our feet and we'll sing uh, the first, second, and last. It's page number 343. here pretty soon in, in, in the air. <laughs> We're going to be revived there. That's going to be a, a good day. Good to see you this evening. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for being good to us, Lord, for loving us. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be back in the house in this middle of the week. Thank you so much for the services that we had this past Sunday. And Lord, uh, Brother Grady that came with us. And Lord, our hearts been encouraged, uplifted, uh, just by that wisdom that you've given him and the knowledge and information, Lord, that we gained there. Lord, I pray that we'll just meditate on those things. And uh, Lord, put those things in our life that need to be there, that we can keep going on for the day. Bless, I pray, this time we have this evening, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, be seated. Well, I tell you what we're going to do, first of all, before we get started and go over our prayer list and our now just a couple of announcements right here. Brother uh, uh, Phillips had led uh, a young lady to Christ this last week, and uh, since we had a guest speaker Sunday, didn't want him, uh, we gave the guest speaker as much time. Let um, me say that as we could, uh, <clears throat> but I tell you what, I love to hear when God's people lead somebody to Christ, when somebody gets saved, uh, and when you cross the path of someone that is saved, got a wonderful testimony, hey, I, listen, we lean on each other on this. We lean on each other, not just one, not just a preacher. We lean on each other, uh, and boy, it encourages us all. Brother uh, Phillips, you come on up here. I'll let you have the microphone so everybody can can hear you there. Yeah, you can go back down the superhighway. <laughs> it's already on. Hi, folks. You know, I'm Art Phillips from Meadowview, New Jersey. I'll just... Uh, a quick word of prayer. Father in heaven, we, we're so thankful that you've allowed to meet with us and you to meet with us. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here tonight. In Jesus' name we ask it. Uh, Thursday, last Thursday, pretty cool day. I had a wood uh, fire going down in my wood stove down in the basement. And about every hour I go out and go around the back and uh, go down and put some wood in the stove. It was just about that time I got up and Walked to the front door, and I saw a, uh, a car had just pulled in my front driveway. And I thought that uh, when we order stuff from Walmart, lately, the last couple months, they have somebody, they deliver it right to our house. Sometimes it's a woman, sometimes it's a man, and they come in their car. And then they deliver what they have, and then they'll back out. Well, I saw this woman pull in. And uh, I just stood there at the steps, and I saw this woman get out of the driver's side, and I thought, well, it must be Walmart. But I looked. 
she started walking up the driveway and she didn't have any packages or anything in her hand. I thought, well, this is unusual. So I went about halfway out and I met her. And I said, hi, uh, ma'am, can I help you? She said, I hope so because I'm lost. I'm disoriented, I'm lost. I said, well, tell me about it, about your lost. She said, well, my, my mother, she said, we live in Chilhowie. This young lady was 29 years old. She was about six foot one. She was a tall girl, really. And I asked her, I said, did you play uh, basketball in high school? She said, no, I played volleyball. But she said, I'm 29 years old. She said, uh, I'm a traveling nurse. So I'm one of those nurses that goes around. So I said, well, uh, what can I do for you? She said, well, I've got a three-year-old daughter at home. We live in Chilhowie. Now, I don't know who she lives with, but she said my mother uh, got on the line on Facebook, and uh, the girl is pregnant, by the way. She's got a baby inside her right now. She said she's due in April, and she said, I need a crib. So my, my mother found one for me on Facebook, and uh, I came to get that. My mother made arrangements with the lady over the phone or whatever and made all the arrangements, but I got to find the house. I said, well, I'll help you. I said, can you give me a name or something? I said, uh, the people next door, I said, could the name be Valerie? She said, that's it, Valerie. I said, wonderful. I said, if you look over there to your right, I said, that's where Valerie lives. I said, they're my neighbors. I said, they're good Christian people. So she said, oh, thank you, thank you. And uh, so I, I asked her, I said, uh, well, do you have a church that you go to? She was going to turn around and walk out. And she said, well, I used to go to, I won't mention, a denominational church. I went there for a while, and uh, I don't go anywhere right now. I said, well, let me ask you a question because I care about you. I said, have you got it all settled? Do you know where you're going to spend eternity when you take your last breath? Do you know what direction you're going to? I said, have you been saved? And, and the Lord showed me something. The Holy Spirit showed me something. She was a, a I want to use the word in the right way. She was a sweet woman. Let me say that. Uh, she was, the Lord showed me something. And uh, I said, have you ever been saved? She said, no, I haven't. Well, at that point, that's the point where a lot of people say, well, this is it. I'm going to hurry now and this and that. I said, you haven't been saved. I said, well, if you have a few minutes, I said, I'd like to take the scriptures. If you, if you, I always ask permission. I said, would you allow me to take the scriptures and show you how you can know according to the scriptures that you can go to heaven. And that's another place where people say no. She said, yeah, yes. Well, I had my truck right there and I had a little Gideon Bible in it, but right on my front porch, I always keep the same gospel tracts that we have right back there as you come in and out. I always keep some right by the picture window. So if somebody, I see somebody walking down the road, I'll holler at him. I hollered at a kid the other day. He was heading toward Abington on a bike. I said, hey. And he come over. He told me he was saved. Anyway, I've got gospel tracks. So I said, just give me a second. I'm going up on the porch here. And let me get some uh, scripture down here for you. So I said, uh, <clears throat> let me just share the scriptures with you. And by the way, she told me, she said, uh, well, you know, I've been a pretty good person. I've been a pretty good person. I believe I'll probably go to heaven. A loving God wouldn't send, send anybody that's been pretty good to heaven, uh, to hell. I said, well, sweetheart, God judges righteous. Righteous judgment, God judges. None of us deserve heaven. I said, let's just go through these scriptures here. And she didn't argue. She just said, oh. So I said, well, right here, you know, I'm not writing any books. I'm not writing any books. I care about your, your eternal destiny. I'm not taking records or I'm not writing books. I said, right here, the playing field's level. There's none righteous, no, not one. 
all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. She's reading it. And uh, got down with, you know, the wages of sin is death. All the way back to Adam and Eve, <laughs> where God, we had to redeem Adam and Eve back to himself. He had to be reconciled back to God. There had to be a blood sacrifice. I said, if you read Genesis, I said, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So she said, oh, I see, I see, I see. I'm trying to make a long story short, but then when we got down the end, I said, uh, you know, Jesus said, everybody that comes into this world has a measure of faith. I said, it's not great faith, but I said, you can take that measure of faith. And I said, if you read this verse right here in Romans 10, 13, read it out loud. Would you read that to me? And she read it. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I said, read it again. She read it again. I said, the Bible says God, over and over, God cannot lie. It's impossible. I said, if it were possible for God to lie, it would be needless to have this conversation. I won't go to church. I'll throw my Bible away. But God cannot lie. And I said, right now, take that measure of faith. I said, do you want to be saved? Do you want to go to heaven? She said, yes, I do. I said, well, sweetheart, right now, I hold the gospel track. Lay your hand right on that verse right now. She laid her hand on the verse. I laid my hand on top of hers. I said, I can't pray you into heaven. I said, that's up to you. God knows all about you. He knows all about you. You have a little conversation with him. Ask him to save you. Ask Jesus to come into your heart. So she started praying. She started praying. I heard her. I wasn't putting words in her mouth. I've sinned. Lord, I've sinned. Lord Jesus, I've sinned. I, I shared with her. I said, Jesus went to the cross. Here's that blood sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. If he hadn't gone to the cross, he gave his life. He gave his blood. And I said, he did that for you and I. So she prayed, and she said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. So she got all done. I said, I heard you praying. Did you mean it? She said, yes, I did. I looked at her, and I told her, John 3, 16, God so loved the world. Amen. And I said, God loves you. I looked her right in the eye, and I said, I love you. And I broke down right in front of her. I broke right down in front of her. I couldn't contain the tears. I'm not ashamed to say that. I broke right down in front of her. And I said, I love you. <laughs> I said, now, I want to share one more scripture. I know you're, and we talked for 30 minutes. You can understand that if you've ever talked to me, right? That's a short conference. That's a short conversation. But I said, uh, we talked 30 minutes. But she never said, I got to get over there, I got to do this, and the neighbor never come over or anything. I said, I have one more scripture I'd like to show you. I said, I said, you have a little boy in your belly. She said, he's due in April. I said, you have a little baby boy in your tummy. And I said, I want to really get you a little more excited. I said, in 1 Corinthians six nineteen. I said, right now, you have two people living inside of you. And she just looked at me. And I said, when you ask Jesus Christ to save you, he saved you. And at that point in time, God placed his Holy Spirit. And I pointed right at her chest. I said, you got that little boy in there now. And now he's got a comforter. That little guy is going to come out in April. But that Holy Spirit isn't coming out. Know ye not that your body is the temple. I said, right now your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. That price is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And, and we just had church here for a few minutes. So uh, I said, well, I, I gave her a gospel track. I always give them a gospel. I wrote on it. I said, today is... What was last Thursday? It was the 4th, November 4th. 
I said, today's November 4th. She told me she's 29. I said, in one year, you'll probably be 30 if Jesus don't come first. But I said, one year from today, you'll be one year old in Christ. You've just been born again. She had known what that was all about. And I said, now you uh, better go over and uh, see my friend Valerie. I told her again the second time. I said, uh, her husband's on the road right now. He's got his own tractor he drives, and he works for himself. I said, go over there and uh, go up to the front door. Well, she went to the front door, and Valerie told her, go around. But that's only half of it. I already told her twice. I said, Valerie's a sweet lady, a sweet Christian lady. So she went around, and I didn't go over there with her. I saw my neighbor the next day. I said, did that girl come over to your house? She said, uh, yeah, she did. She said she wanted that crib. I said, Valerie, before that girl got over there, God saved her right in my driveway. She said, what? She said, that's wild. I said, it is. I told the girl in the driveway, I said, this is a divine appointment. You didn't get lost. You're not lost. You were lost. But now you're found. God sent you, and she nodded her head. I said, God sent you here today to hear the truth of the gospel. So the next day, I was talking to my neighbor. I said, that girl, Amanda, her name is, she got saved in my driveway. She said she did. She said, yeah. Now, they had made a deal over the phone or over wherever they were doing, texting or whatever. They had made, now, my neighbors don't buy cheap junk. You know, baby stuff is expensive. And... Uh, so she knocked on the door, Valerie told her, drive around to the back, and they, uh, she put the uh, crib, and they had made a, a thing over the phone between Valerie and the girl's mother of $60 for the crib without the mattress. mattress uh, Valerie told me the next day that is a very, very expensive mattress. I was going to keep it. You can wash it and all that stuff. She said, so they put the crib. We had, we had agreed on 60 bucks. And uh, we put the crib in there, and uh, my neighbor said, uh, well, what do you have? What, all, what, you know, what do you need? What do you have? The girl looked at her. He said, she said, I have nothing. I have nothing. Well, my neighbor looked at the girl, said, you have nothing. She said, well, come back in my basement. She gave her the mattress free. She gave her a bassinet free. She had tons of stuff because she had two daughters, which are grown now, and they got grandchildren. That woman next door was loaded down. She probably gave her f probably at least $400 worth of stuff. And the girl, and Valerie kept telling her, well, take that, take that. Would it look at it if you need to take it. And the, girl, and the girl said to her, she said, uh, well, I'll have to come back tomorrow and bring some more money. My neighbor told me, she looked at the girl, she said, I love you. I love you. That was twice in 45 minutes that she ran into a Christian that cared about her. And I'm not lifting my, please, please hear me where I'm coming from. If you know me, if you know me, I hope you know where I'm coming from. I care about souls. And... My neighbor said to me, that's crazy, Art. She said, your mailbox got your name on it, got the big letters. She drove right past mine. She told, she told me, she, she said, I told her mother, I'm right across from Dillo's gas station. She went right past my mailbox with the name and number. I said, Valerie, that was a divine appointment. So, girl got saved. She got went out of there, loaded to the hilt, and listen to me careful. I don't care about materialism. I was 85 years old yesterday. Or you don't, no, you don't have to say, you don't have to say happy. I don't care. I'm not into materialism. I'm not into cakes. That's fine. I love cake. I love pie. But I pray to God. I said, God. You just gave me my birthday present. And not only that, Father, you gave me my Christmas present. 
It's not that you can't put more people in my path between now and Christmas. I hope you do. But Father God, you just gave me my birthday present. I am eternally grateful. I live to see souls saved. I don't care how much money you got. I don't need money. I don't need a house. I don't need more trucks. I want to talk to more people about Jesus. To God be all the glory. Amen, brother. To God be the glory. Amen. I appreciate that. I always love to hear those testimonies. Yeah, yeah. Well, happy birthday. Amen. <laughs> All right. Amen. Amen. I always... Oh, it's always good to get excited about the things of the Lord. Praise the Lord, and people do. And uh, thank God for that. Love to hear those testimonies. Veterans, hey, happy Veterans Day tomorrow, of course. And uh, gave you the meal the other day, so hey, uh, definitely that. Uh, just be thinking about all the veterans and stuff like that. Now, don't forget this Sunday, of course, I'll have a meal here at the church. I'm going to preach a message, of, uh, a little bit of a reminiscing type of testimony there, but... Uh, uh, then after church, we'll go over here and eat, and then uh, practiced a little bit with my brother and sister. We was all just kind of rusty and stuff like that today, so we'll sing a little bit while we uh, eating or after we eat or something like that. Let me go over our prayer list here before Brother, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, Brother Gary, I tell you what, we'll uh, uh, go over our prayer list right here, and then... Um, you can play the dulcimer this evening, and then we'll come back for the uh, <clears throat> for the prayer and our Bible lesson this evening. But let's pray for Larry and Janice Hayton. Uh, and uh, I got, let me see, I wrote this down wrong here, but uh, Larry, uh, pray for Larry and Janice Hayton. And uh, there's one I got down here. One of them's near death, and I had. Uh, I'll double check my notes there, but uh, let's pray for Rachel Berry. Uh, let's pray for Penny Heath, uh, for Kent Ramsey that has some kidney problems, for Ernest Hurd. Let's pray for Trent Heath. That's Brother Gary's brother. It's in the hospital with type 1 flu. Uh, so let's pray for this one. Let's pray for um, <clears throat> Norman Shoemaker. Uh, has a mass on his brain. They are going to try to operate. They don't expect very much, but... Uh, when people are at the point of survival, you know, they will, you know, go those routes. So there's not a big possibility uh, of success in that surgery, but if you would remember to pray for that because, hey, God, it's not over till God says it's over. Uh, so let's uh, turn those over to the Lord. Toby Hicks, let's pray for this one with colon cancer. And then uh, Paul Prater family where he had passed away there. All right, Brother Gary, <clears throat> and we'll pray after this. Amen. Well, I tell you, we've got a lot to be thankful for, don't we? Amen. New names written down in glory and God answering prayers. Right here, right before the rapture, isn't it? If you want to turn tonight and kind of read along, we're not going to sing along, but there's no more beautiful hymn uh, than the one found on page 281. You might want to read along with it. And um, it's one of those songs, as I started learning it, the melody started singing the words to me. I can hear the words in the melody. And uh, interesting enough, someone different wrote the melody from the person that wrote the lyrics. I know it's Fanny Crosby, but William Doan wrote the melody. And uh, I just find that amazing. You know, the Bible says that we're to encourage ourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. 
And I think this this song, as you read along with it, there's no, I just don't know a prettier song in there to learn. So pray for us as we attempt to play it. It's 281 if you want to follow along. It's called Do Not Pass Me By. Brother Gary. All right. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and pray. Take these prayer requests to the Lord this evening. And we're going to be back again in the book of Job this evening. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you, we thank you so much. Lord, that you are still working for those that are uh, that are still have a prepared heart. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to always be aware. Lord, of all those people that we cross paths with. Lord, there's many people that are stubborn and, and do not want you. You know that. But, Lord, there's so so many people that we may have slipped by because we've been distracted by things of our own selfishness or this world. Father, thank you so much for the testimony of Brother Phillips in leading this young lady to Christ. And I pray, God, that you would help us all to have that burden. That everywhere we go, we just keep that leaky seed basket to tell people about Christ. Thank you for the one that Miss Lisa led to the Lord. God, I pray that you'd put a hedge about each one of these. And, Lord, give them the opportunity to grow uh, in the time that we have left here on this earth. 
God, I pray you please just draw them uh, near uh, and help someone to come by to give them the right words to say that their life can be fulfilled. All these other prayer requests we have here this evening, Lord, we lay them at thy feet. We trust thee for the outcome of each one of them. And Lord, if, uh, whatever thy will may be, Lord, we know it's going to be right. But Lord, we do ask that you please help uh, the right people to come by, to have the right words to say. Lord, if someone needs encouragement, that, that encouragement will come from the Holy Spirit. And Lord, if someone needs salvation, may they have the right words to say. The Holy Spirit can work in their lives. Thank you for our time that we have here this evening. Father, as we gather around thy word, we pray the Holy Spirit will speak to us. Thank you for it. Thank you so much for it. Thank you for our church and our people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Job chapter number 38 again this evening. Job chapter number 38. <clears throat> and I tell you what, we've had some pretty days the last couple of days. I want to say, you know, uh, I don't want to be the uh, bringer of bad news. And uh, <laughs> I remember one fella, one time, he, you, you've seen those type people that everything is, uh, that they say is always negative. Well, I ain't going to be here long. You better get ready. The snows are coming. It's right around the corner. Um, I remember Billy Bray. Billy Bray used to be a shouter. Boy, he was a preacher, but he would shout everywhere. He would shout everywhere. And he'd, they'd ask him uh, why he shouted all the time. He said, I got a lot to be thankful for. That's why. I just shout, shout, shout. He said one day he had some fellas get, uh, they was going to get over on him and scare him to death. So they got in the bushes in a path that he usually walked, and he would be praying while they're walking. And he said, uh, they was walking down that pathway, and those fellas in that uh, bushes in the dark there while he was walking and praying, they said, Dad, hey, Billy. And Billy stopped and said, Billy. And he said, stop. And he's just listening. And he said, it's the devil. He said, Billy, it's the devil. What are you shouting about now? And Billy Bray just started shouting. <coughs> just running up and down the path, just started shouting and said, <laughs> ask, why are you shouting now? He said, I didn't know you were that far away from me. <laughs> he said, I thought you was a whole lot closer. Hey, there's always something to shout about. There really is. Uh, all right, Job chapter number 38. Just go ahead and remain seated here. <coughs> We're going to jump right back into some of this, and uh, I'm just kind of scatterbrained around some of these chapters, 38, 39, 40, 41, because of the way the Lord was talking, and his boy, uh, the Lord just kind of lays them on my heart. I just love to uh, study on them, but look at verse number one. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, we talked about that whirlwind. God comes riding in on a whirlwind. Uh, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof that thou knowest, or who stretched the line upon it? Where upon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? I'm going to chat with you again tonight in this thing because as the Lord laid this thought on my heart the what about those foundations what about those foundations we talked a little bit about it uh, before I'll just give you a quick review of that and give you a little bit of other Bibles that we need to kind of put into our life all right uh, let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us <clears throat> and now Holy Spirit we do ask Lord that you would teach us Lord every time we open this Bible we need the master teacher to help us to understand so I do pray, Lord, tonight that you would encourage our hearts once again with our love for Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in a previous lesson, we talked about the foundations of the earth and how God had laid them. We said that, uh, first of all, we said this, and I'm just give you a quick review here, that man had no say in it because he wasn't there. We can uh, flatter ourselves all we want to, but in verse number four, God said, where were you? When I laid the foundations, where were you, Job? You know it all. You've been talking about all this. You've been defending all the, all the things going on around with you. Where were you when it all started? I'd like to ask some uh, college professors at Devil State University. Where were you when it all started? 
Oh, wow, we got these great minds. Wait a minute, where were those great minds when it all started? So we know this, man had no say in it because he wasn't there. Number two, God laid the foundation. God laid the foundation of everything. And number three, the earth does have foundations. We studied this. First of all, they're measured. Secondly, they're accurate. Thirdly, they're fastened down. And fourthly, there is a cornerstone. Uh, that's why, verse number five, who laid the measures? Uh, who has stretched the line? Uh, where are the foundations fastened? Who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now, those are the things that we just talked about. Now, we know these facts about these verses right here. Verse number 18 even tells us that the earth has breadth. In other words, it is a distance. Now, this concerns, of course, size. Now, because of all of these facts, we look for tangible information to establish our understanding. By the way, that's our nature. Uh, to wrap our head around what we can see so we can understand. But here's the conundrum. That's the big word uh, Brother Grady had used the other day. He, what would he call it? 50%, 50 cent word or something like a seven dollar word? Uh, in chapter 26, verse number 7 of Job, here's the whole dilemma. The Bible says, He stretches out the north over the empty place, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. That's 26 uh, and verse number 7. Now, we look for tangible measurements. We get a tape ruler out, and we pull, thing, we pull it out to 25 foot and measure something 25 foot. If we want to, to measure stars and distances, we get compasses and sextants out. and We measure things that way. There's all kinds of radars. There's, we measure things by tangible distance. This is why God said, and he put in here, the earth has some foundation. It's measurable, it's accurate, it is fastened down, and it, um, uh, it has a cornerstone. That's how we understand things. But when we, okay, what is the measure of it? Where is it fastened down? And then we get this dilemma. God says, I'm hanging it on nothing. <laughs> but wait a minute now. It's not nothing of temporal things that we judge things God is hanging he's telling us it's not anything we can measure with any kind of measuring device that we have this is where man gets confused but God gets the glory we looked at this the foundations of the earth are the word of God I'll show you this I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 1 Hebrews chapter 1 one, and then we're going to come back here again in just a few minutes. Hebrews chapter 1, you can write these other verses down if you'd like. John 1, 3, the Bible said this, uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was, the, uh, was with God, and the Word was God. And the Bible says this, that by Him all things were made that were made. Uh, in Hebrews chapter number 1, notice what the Bible says in verse number 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. That little line right there tells us the foundations of this earth, why it's fastened down, why it can be, how it can be measured, and uh, it, all it is um, how accurate it is. It's because God's Word is holding it together. Now, wait a minute. We can't grasp that with a measuring tape. We can't grasp that with any kind of device of measurement. So the discourse of the creation God is giving Job is a discourse about His Word. It is a discourse of His Word about His Word. All right, because that's where all the foundation... He said, this, Job... If thou hast understanding, I want you to tell me, all the things that you see that are falling apart and in your world, it may seem like the foundations are crumbling, but the foundations, Job, are not what you see. The foundations, Job, are what I say. That's what God says. That's what holds it all 
together. That's why the Bible says this, Matthew 24 and verse number 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, they're not going to pass away. Hey, you know what? As long as we got God's word, we don't have to worry if the ice caps are melting. We don't have to worry if the, the, if the ground's rumbling. We don't even have to worry about the snail darter or the spotted owl. We don't have to worry about uh, global warming, global cooling. We don't have to worry about any of that. Look at our time. We see happenings that unbelievers are concerned with. All this stuff that's going on about these, uh, um, uh, what do they call it, stimulus packages and things like that, that they're trying to pass all of those things so basically get more money, you know what they're doing? So we can protect ourselves from the future. And a lot of people are fighting their freedoms. The world is starting to crumble apart with earthquakes, famines, floods, Pestilence. It's no wonder people want to save the planet. They think that, uh, that the earth itself, the tangible earth, is the foundation of all. What do you hear that? Hey, if we lose the planet, we all die. That's true. <laughs> you don't need an education. But listen, now, what they think is our throwing trash out the window, and I'm not for that. And spraying your hair with spray, with hairspray, and uh, 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 driving cars, and all this summit. They said they had so many jets at the World Sun Climate Summit that they had to fly them out and park them at other places. I mean, these people are. Spent, and Joe Biden goes over there with an eighty-five car entourage. He's saving the planet. <laughs> Ten years, I don't know. <laughs> but what's this? They say, hey, if we lose the planet, we all die. Duh. That's common sense. But wait a minute now. If you believe God's word, we're not going to lose this planet. Not until God says it's time. That's why it's God's word that holds it together. As long as God is speaking, guess what? we got a planet to live on. If we throw this word of God out, somebody asked me one time, you believe in global warming? Well, I don't believe in the agenda because the agenda simply means that they want everybody to worship creation. I think, though, that if God wants to warm up his planet, he's doing it to get our attention. You know, wow, Brother Dean, here's a science that says it's not happening. Here's a science. I don't do all the studying and pull out the test tubes myself, so I can't say 100% sure. But I do know this. One day, God is going to warm this planet up, except he's going to set it on fire then. So they say, is it all warming up now? I don't really know. I can take a side, you know, the liberals over here and the conservatives over here, the scientists over here and the philosophers over here and you got all, all this, hey, it's all warming up because this happened and this happened and this happened. I really don't know because the chaotic events that happen on this earth usually are caused by some kind of man's involvement some way. So I don't believe in that agenda that there is such a thing as global warming because all it is is just like all the other movements. It's a way just to get money. But God wants to do something to his plan and he's going to do it. Why? Because it's his word that's going to do it. But since mankind has kicked God's word out, God will show what really does hold it all together one of these days. Now, uh, as Psalm 18 says this, that the channels of water were seen and the foundations of the earth were discovered at thy rebuke. Talked about when the Red Sea opened up and they saw the dry ground down there. They thought that was the foundation of the earth. Watch this now. Just like they thought that, one of these days God is really going to do this. He's going to open up the heavens and he's going to let mankind see again the true foundations of this earth and what holds it all together. It's not the dry land of creation. It's the word of his power. Now, when God said the foundations were measured, accurate, fastened down, and had a cornerstone, he's giving us an assurance of his word. I tell you, uh, <clears throat> I just love to hear preaching. And Brother Grady, of course, here the other day, just the, the preaching and the different things that I've read in his books and, and uh, just studying this Bible over many, many years, reading other books about this Bible. I tell you, this Bible gets more exciting every day because 
it's almost like God uh, just wrote a daily paper of everything that's going to happen. Watch this. We measure things by earthly sight, so God uses that to give us confidence in his word and how it is measured. It is accurate. It is fastened down, and it has a cornerstone. Now, here's one of my main point for this evening. In um, turn, flip over to Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28. I'm going to go to two or three different passages here. Isaiah chapter number 28. <clears throat> Look, if you would, in verse number 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious corner stone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. What is he talking? Here is a foundation. Now listen, the foundation of creation is God's word. But God said it has a cornerstone. You see, uh, it, all this stuff about it being measured, accurate, and fastened down, it's all built around a cornerstone. What is that cornerstone? Isaiah 28, 16 tells us that Jesus Christ, that, that will be Jesus Christ. Now look at um, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Now, let me see here. Uh, Isaiah 28 tells us he's going to lay that foundation, the chief cornerstone. And by the way, that word Zion, that's an interesting thing. I've been working a message on Zion. You know Zion, uh, God said he's going to put his name there. But you ever look at the map of Zion, it's not talking about that little town of Zion in Israel. Because it ain't nothing but a dead and dry and dusty, rocky place. It has no fer fertile, uh, fertileness about it or anything like that. When God talks about Zion, God talks about the center of God's presence. The place that God is going to center everything up on. Uh, but anyway, I'll come back to that one. But Ephesians chapter number 2. I want you to look at verse number 20. And here's what the Bible said. And are built upon the foundation... Of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being what? The chief corner stone. All right. Back over to uh, 1 Peter chapter number 2. 1 Peter chapter number 2. Here's what 1 Peter said about it. 1 Peter chapter number 2 and verse number 6. Here's what he said. Behold, wherefore also... It is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So that chief cornerstone is Jesus Christ. Said it in Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number eight, uh, uh, verse number uh, 20 there. Now, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 1 again. Bring us all down here toward a close, something practically that we can put in our life, that we can do to help to grow our faith. Hebrews chapter number 1, and look at verse number 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. You know, the very foundation of this world has a, chief, has a cornerstone. And the Bible tells us the cornerstone, of course, is Jesus Christ. That, that foundation is God's Word. That's why the Bible said in John 1, 1, that in the beginning was the Word. The Word's with God. The Word was God. That chief cornerstone is Jesus Christ. The center of all God's creation is the cornerstone. Everything rests on Jesus Christ. He's the heir of all things. He holds it all together. He, th listen, the searches for all creation has to be centered around Jesus Christ. That's the very foundation. That's what you put down. Then you build the house. You build the, the building. You build the belief based on that, uh, the foundation of that cornerstone. 
That's good theology, by the way, and that's good science, both. You see, watch this. Creation is not in physical science. It's in the science of one person. That's Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to go, if you would, to Matthew 11. Matthew chapter number 11. Jesus Christ was on this earth. Uh, of course, the greatest teacher, and he, ta and he taught everything that uh, the Father was pleased with him, the Bible said, and the Father wanted him to teach. He taught it all. In Matthew chapter number 11, and verse number 29, I want you to watch this. In verse 28, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you what? Rest. Now notice what he says. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Boy, we leave those things out so many times. What would Jesus do? Hey, learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. Now watch this. And ye shall find rest and do your souls. Let me tell you this. <clears throat> if we're not learning about Jesus Christ, we have no understanding of the foundation of all creation. We have no understanding of the fact that it is... That Jesus Christ, that word, this world is held together by that book right there. God's very word. One of the greatest people I have ever read about was a fellow by the name of George Mueller. I love George Mueller. I'd read everything and anything by George Mueller. And I uh, read, read the book about George Mueller. I read two or three different autobiographies. George Mueller... <clears throat> he was a preacher, of course, in the 1800s. He had an orphanage of 5,000 children in Bristol, England. He had no government support. He just prayed. And God would send the people. God would send the kids in to his orphanage. And then God would send the people to... Uh, many times in reading those books about George Mueller, he would bow his head over children lined up at tables and nothing to eat and he would start praying and many times the answer to the, by the end of the prayer there would be somebody show up with food for all those orphans uh, and boy I used to just read about it some of the most amazing things that he prayed for when I read his book about um, uh, answer the uh, answers to prayer by George Mueller. I <clears throat> he had five different uh, things that he based his prayer life on, and some of these are uh, are familiar to us. First of all, there was one of them was separation from all known sin. He said this: If we regard iniquity in our hearts, the Lord will not hear us, for He would be then sanctioning sin. So get rid of sin. And then he said this, Faith in God's word of promise has confirmed by his oath. Not to believe God is to make him both a liar and a perjurer. Whew. That's pretty harsh. We almost can't take that in this day and time. You know, it hurt my feelings. Uh, watch this. Uh, he said this, number three, act, asking in accordance to with his will our motives must be godly we must seek any not seek any gift of god to consume it upon our lust now watch this fourthly he said importunity and supplication in other words just keep at it there must be waiting on god and waiting for god but it was the very first one that caught my attention by the way these other four that i just read here that he based his whole prayer life on uh, you can find these easily in the Bible, but this first one caught my attention. He said this, I have, he said, if you want prayers answered, it must be entire dependence on the merits and meditation of the Lord Jesus Christ as the only ground of any claim for blessing. You know what he said? He said the found. Uh, he, he was saying that uh, <clears throat> what I do to make sure my prayers are answered, the very first thing I do is meditate on Jesus all the time. Boy, I tell you what, I thought to, 
when I first read that, and boy, that grabs my attention and stuff. Meditation on Jesus Christ. Well, there's not a verse in the Bible about that. The Bible says don't you know pray so you can consume it upon your lust. And the Bible talks about God won't hear us. We got sin in our life. But when he said, I meditate on Jesus Christ and a man that's proven God opening the windows of heaven at his very breath when he bowed his head. Boy, a man that proves that. Hey, we ought to take note. Of something like that. And if God said I'm holding this whole world together. By a foundation it's called my word. It's got a cornerstone. My word is built around my son Jesus Christ. It would behoove us to take Matthew chapter 11 verse 29 seriously. And Jesus said you won't rest in your soul. Learn of me. Boy that's as simple as. We can almost hit ourselves in the head and say, man, if we would just, see what we try to do, we overcomplicate this thing. And we'll just think about Jesus. For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. The foundations of our faith is in the cornerstone of Jesus. I'm, I'm afraid in this day and time, we've got more faith in Donald Trump than we do in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not president. He's God. It rules over all presidents and all leaders. Second Peter, or First Peter. Let me just jump over here and read this to you here real quick. First Peter chapter number 2. First Peter chapter number 2, verse number 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. We read that part, but look at verse number two, seven, rather. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he's precious. He is precious. But of them, but of them to, unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed the same is made the head of the corner. God said this, there's a cornerstone. Everything's centered around one thing. Let me ask you, what is your life centered around? What is our life centered around? Is it just family? All oh, family's important. Is our mind centered around just everything that we've got to do? Everything that we have our hands involved in, is it centered around all that? Listen, I can't stress this enough. Uh <clears throat> When modernists and unbelievers say to us, oh, that's just religion, it's not science. I got news for you, friend. Learning of Jesus Christ, it, there's a religious adherence to that. Question is, are you learning of him? That's where science really is. That's the foundation of everything. Are we sticking to that thought right there? When you get up in the morning, what are you thinking about? Oh, listen, there's a lot to get our attention. There's a lot to get our mind. Boy, I just love, one reason, <laughs> I like driving. I just turn everything off, and I just think. I just think. I'll talk to the Lord at times. I'll write, I'll pick up a piece of paper and write a thought down, but I just like to think. Boy, I got the under conviction as I was going back over this right here, and I said, Lord, please forgive me. I'm not thinking about Jesus enough. Enough. Boy, that's where our faith is. Listen, when we get the cornerstone settled, then the measuring, the accuracy, the fastened down parts, they take care of themselves. But boy, I tell you, if we'll just learn of Him. Now, this is where God's Word comes in again. Second Peter 1 19, the Bible said this. Uh, or, uh, I'm going to, let me see here. Let me read this to you. Second Peter chapter 1, verse number 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. That sure word of prophecy is this word of God. That is Jesus Christ. That is the cornerstone of creation and everything. Uh, Psalm eleven three says this, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's why in Revelation 3, 2, he said this, Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain. Now, if we went back to Job 38, and we're running a little bit out of time here, but uh, in Job chapter number 38, verse number 11, 
Bible said this, God was talking to Job and said, Hither, he's talking about the waves coming up on the shore. God said this, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. Verse number 12, God asked Job, Hast thou commanded the son? Hast thou, wait a minute, what's God telling you? God is saying, this, war, this whole world, creation, everything, it's all gauged by my word. Don't think gravity holds the ocean in the, in the uh, basins. Don't think that uh, the consistency of sunrise causes it gonna, to come up again tomorrow. What going, what's going to cause it to come up? God is. You see, give God the credit. Because God says this, hey, Mr. Ocean, you just stop right there. <laughs> God says, all right, hey, 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 son, it's time to wake up, go on around. Got some people over here in America need to wake up, put them back to bed at night, wake up the Chinese, and then we go back around the earth, back around and around and around. That's how God does it. That's how God does it. I'll tell you what, that's a, boy, that's exciting to me because you know what? I don't need to know. All the equations of distances and square roots and pi times square and everything else about planets lining up and all the astrologies and all that stuff. All I have to do is learn of him because that's where the chief cornerstone is. Miss Terry had showed me a book the, uh, yesterday and uh, just kind of was glancing at it. It was a children's book. and uh, she, uh, <clears throat> I'd never heard of it, but uh, the title was this, The Jesus Storybook Bible. And I looked at it, but I like the subtitle best because the subtitle really run a shiver up my spine. It says this, every story whispers his name. <laughs> I tell you, what, I like that right there. You know what? Every time the donkey bellows, it's saying he's coming. Every time... Uh, my, our neighbors across the, high, across the road, they got a bunch of goats in uh, about six weeks ago. They lasted about three days, and all them goats were gone. But that was the biggest hen-sounding party I ever heard over there with them goats. Whoa, yeah. I mean, you'd think it's somebody done threw a cat in a rotor rooter or something. I mean, them goats going crazy. Uh, but you know what they're doing? Here's a coming. Here's a coming. Here's a coming. Every time I say, Brother Billy Kelly said that years ago, and I, every time I hear a donkey go, he's a coming, he's a coming. Boy, that's what it's all about. He's the chief cornerstone. I looked over in the field today, the goats are gone, but you know what they got over there? They got two hogs the size of Volkswagens. I'm talking about these are monster hogs. I'm talking about Hogzilla. These things, I mean, are just... And they're just bunching up just the two of them down there. I mean, you know, uh, Bertha and Big One. They're just down there in the bottom there, you know. And I ain't got to hear them scream or holler or make the noise or anything like that. But I guarantee you, and I hear that... They're going, he's coming, he's coming... Uh, that's what creation does. The Bible said the earth groaneth for the coming of the Lord. Whew, it's all about Jesus Christ. Guess what? You say, Buddy, I don't understand it all. Well, you don't really have to. You just got to learn of him. He'll learn, you learn of him. When we learn of him, he'll teach us what we need to know. That's what God was getting across to Job. Job, where's those foundations? Let's go all the way to the cornerstone. And then God brings us to the cornerstone. It's him stepping off the throne and coming down here as his own son. Boy, I tell you what, that's not over our head. It's something we can believe, but God will teach it to us as we get it. Heavenly Father, thank you for these great truths. Thank you so much for all this creation we look at as Lord's we're driving through the mountains and looking at the beauty of the trees and everything and hear the leaves rustle. We can hear the whisper of Jesus and all those things. Lord, we give you all the honor and the glory to be able to have, uh, to have believed because someone told us of that. Lord, my heart breaks for those that have never been told or those that won't believe. Maybe some parents were neglectful at times and didn't tell their children, and those children grew up not believing. God, I pray you help us to do our part that maybe some can believe, but Lord, thank you so much that we got to believe. I pray, God, you strengthen that by helping us learn of you. 
Bless, I pray, Lord Jesus, our time we had here tonight. Help us to meditate on these. Most of all, I pray, Lord, tomorrow we'll get up, and when we're wondering what to think about, we'll just think about your son. Everything that he did for us, all that he's going to do for us, thank you so much. Keep us safe as we go our separate ways this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I appreciate you coming this evening. Good evening. God bless you.